Good evening, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, very kind invitation. Uh, I'm new to this part of uh, the world, I suppose. I uh, just came down from Canada a couple of months ago. And people don't believe me that this is the first time I'm actually coming to New Jersey. So, <laughs> great welcome and great to see some friends that I spent uh, part of uh, last summer together in Bat Magan, Hayastan. Uh, I only have four or five minutes, so I'm going to be very brief and I'm going to make uh, three very specific points. Uh, the first one is coming to this whole issue of uh, the diaspora. Now, who exactly is this diaspora? My first point is that there is no such thing as one Armenian diaspora. There are several diasporas. And the most fundamental divide or the most fundamental division is the established diaspora, what I call the established diaspora, those Armenians who are descendants from 1915 survivors, from the genocide survivors. The majority or many of the Armenians in, in this room and in the United States. And the other side is what I call the post-Soviet diaspora. Those are, often we call them Hayastansi, the Armenians who have migrated out of Armenia and have settled in the diaspora, especially since 1988. And I think there is a very big divide between, between these two uh, diasporas. One is a Dashnak mic, the other one is a non <laughs> Which leads to the, uh, now interestingly I just made this as after cuff comment, the other point I was going to make is that the old Iron Curtain, which is now starting to dissolve in the diaspora, between the Dashnak and the non dashnak is starting to be replaced by this new division between the newcomers and established uh, diaspora. And these are very two different entities because their point of reference, their emotional links to the homeland are, are very different. One is tied to the ancestral village, to Van, Bidlis, etc., etc., and has this emotional link. The other one is tied to the real current village, to Armenia, to the state. And the way they deal with it is very differently. One is much more, you know, through the politics of gen genocide recognition. The other one is the remittances going there and having family links, structural links. So uh, this is an important divide. Part of this is also the emergence of a new diaspora center, which is in Russia. We tend to forget in the United States that the biggest Armenian diaspora is not here, it's in Russia. And these are the people who are sending most of the money to Armenia. It's not the American Armenians or you know, Argentinian Armenians or whatever the case might be. And in my view, this is going to be the new sort of center of uh, the diaspora in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Now, when I was speaking to Arda a couple of days ago about, about uh, this event, she insisted that I should come up also you know, with some concrete ideas. So here is my first sort of very concrete suggestion, is that we, these two parts of the diaspora do not understand each other, do not know each other very well. Why don't we actually commission a study to see what the Russian Armenians live like, or what are their issues? And we'll be surprised to see the commonalities uh, in some cases, but also some of the differences. And I think we need to understand who this new diaspora is if we are going to engage with them and if we are going to engage in any kind of united effort to deal with the homeland, the, the Republic of Armenia, or one of the homelands, the Republic of Armenia. So that's my first point. The second point is regarding uh, the, the genocide and the recognition of the genocide. In three years, it's going to be 100 years, and it's going to be a huge commemoration over the world. But we have to sort of think strategically, and we have to think beyond what's going to happen after 100 years. Is the genocide going to remain as forceful element as it is now for the established diaspora? Now, trauma could be intergenerational. It could come from one generation to the next to the next. However, there is a point that it starts, it starts to lose its grip. At the same time in the established diaspora, there is a fatigue of Armenia, and, and uh, Edgar referred to that. Uh, a lot of Armenians in the diaspora are saying, we had enough of this republic, we're just going to, you know, focus on ourselves, uh, enough is enough. Combine this sort of declining interest in the genocide, if that happens, 
combining with the fact that there's this Armenian fatigue and the fact that the demography of Armenia simply cannot sustain the diaspora for too much longer. The Middle East communities that nourish the, the Western diaspora have the window themselves. What is it that going to be in the future that is going to sort of be the rallying point of, uh, of uh, our meetings in the diaspora? And here we come to some of the things that uh, Edgar said. And I think one of the elements is that, and this is similar to many other diasporas, I mean, if we look at diasporas comparatively, uh, the diaspora acts a bit like the conscience of, uh, of the homeland, of the republic. To be more critically engaged, now we are engaged at this point, but to be more critically engaged, and critically engaged doesn't mean criticizing all the time. It means asking some legitimate questions. A um, couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was at an event at Fordham University organized by the Student Society there, and it was about human rights in Armenia. And the Student Society is predominantly made up of this point of Armenians from Armenia, and their interest is not the traditional interest of the established diaspora. It's the, it's the human rights of what's going on in Armenia and what, it's, uh, what the Republic is doing. So here is another concrete suggestion. Support this kind of emergent, innovative, new events that are taking place, largely organized by young people from Armenia, in order to broaden the debate, in order to challenge our own perceptions as established diaspora, and in order to, as I said, be the conscience of uh, the Republic to some degree. Second point here that I would make, this is point two, point two. The second point here is I would make, and it's a very current issue in terms of lobbying and what we're engaging in all that. There is a lot of talk of war in the Middle East with uh, Israeli strikes against Iran and America being involved in all that. This kind of, if this comes to pass, it will be absolutely detrimental for Armenia and the Republic. I think as a diaspora, we should engage in being some sort of a peace lobby so that this kind of war doesn't happen in our neighborhood or in the neighborhood of the Republic of Armenia. The third point I will make, and I think I'm within my uh, time limit uh, here, is that it is pretty easy to criticize Armenia. Uh, nothing changes there, they're all corrupt, da 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 and nothing has ever changed with the diaspora relations and, uh, and whatnot. I wouldn't go as far as saying that. Armenia did change its, policy, did change its policy towards the diaspora. A lot of it was cosmetic, I, I agree with that, and I've been to all four Armenia diaspora conferences. A lot of it was cosmetic, but they did establish a ministry of the diaspora. They did change the citizenship law to give diasporans citizenship, which costs $10 if you actually want to become a citizen of Armenia, which is pretty straightforward. And it did, um, you know, it does train teachers, it does do this. So a lot of these things are taking place, and I think we should be fair and we should recognize that. But there is a red line, and this comes to Narek's uh, case as well. There is a red line that is not tolerated being crossed in Armenia, and that has to do, that has to do with the oligarchy and the monopolistic capitalist system that they have established there. It's very welcoming your diaspora, come spend time here and bring money, you know, send your children here, but and send money here, but don't try to invest in a way that is going to challenge our competition here or, or our monopoly here. So don't be competition to us. And I think that whenever diaspora businessmen crosses that line, the consequences we know. Uh, and here I don't have a concrete uh, suggestion because this is what depresses me the most. Uh, I don't see a very easy solution out of it. And it is intertwined with the whole corruption issue. But again, mind you, it's not related just to Armenia, but it's still the whole corruption issue that is leading uh, the country. So those are the three points I would make. And I think I spoke for about five minutes, which was the time I was allowed. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.